Hi Facebook, we are live from NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. My name is Julia Badger, I'm the Robonaut Project Manager. I'm Jonathan Rogers, the Deputy Project Manager. And we're going to talk to you about that has been built to be a astronaut assistant or a spacecraft caretaker. And so we have a few demos that we want to show you. Our robot is meant to be safe to work around humans, to do real work, and it's humanoid so that it can use the same sort of tools and interfaces that humans do. So our very first demo here, I'll let you see it, is just showing range of motion, dexterity, and the speed of our robot. So this robot was built um, in a partnership with General Motors back in the 2008 time frame. We built a second robot around that same time and sent him to space. He went up on a STS-133, the second to last space shuttle mission, and is on the International Space Station doing some really cool technology development right now. We like to have a lot of fun with our robot. We are doing this demonstration because Jay, our PAO guy, loves Karate Kid. But we also like to show that this older brother here is a little jealous of his younger brother on the International Space Station. But he keeps it together and does our demos anyway. The robot's hands are meant to be as anthropomorphic, as human-like as possible so that we can use the same tools as the, the ones that are already up there for the human crew members on the International Space Station. And you can see we're at least as dexterous as a suited astronaut. For the human safety, I'm going to show a demonstration. Basically, we're able to measure the torque in each one of our joints using a series elastic actuator where we have a spring with two position sensors on either side. Since we can measure the deflection of the spring and we know the spring right, we can get torque. Um, that's really useful so because there are tight spaces on the International Space Station, so anytime the astronaut might be moving around next to it, it can always just kind of hold the robot back from accomplishing its task because we're only putting in a, a, as much effort or as much torque as is needed to succeed with this goal. Robonaut sits around and kind of waits until it gets to its position, and it's easy to stop the robonaut any place in its trajectory to keep going. This human safety is one of our absolute best technology advances. We are too fault tolerant and excessive force, which means we can't push, hit, or do anything that's um, too hard on any of the sensitive equipment and the humans up on the International Space Station. The next demonstration we'd like to show you is that not only are we human safe like this, but our robot can do real work. And I think Jay would volunteer to show off with us. So, Robonaut and Jay are both going to take a 20 pound weight. And no cheating, Robonaut. <laughs> we're totally setting Jay up, but. Uh, 20 pounds is an important number for us on the International Space Station so that we can, there's a requirement that any of our orbital replacement units must be able to be replaced with 20 pounds of force or less. General Motors had a similar thing, that they had a water deflector to install inside a car door that needed 20 pounds of effort as well. So that was our benchmark that we wanted to achieve and so that's why we show this demo here. We go really slow so that Jay can start sweating before the end of the demo. <laughs> oh man, you're doing good. Look at the gym. <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> so while humans' peak strength is greater than the robot, so we can push harder and put more impulse into things. The robot has much more endurance than humans do, so when Jay starts shaking. Like I am right now, everybody. <laughs> we'll go ahead and keep on. <laughs> keep on going. We can actually hold the weight out there for about 30 minutes before we start seeing some of our motors heat up a little bit. Let's not do that. <laughs> technology development test bed on the International Space Station. We are trying to develop methods for um, doing autonomous caretaking for future exploration missions. We're hoping to send stuff first and then send humans. So basically we'll have, have
habitats and spacecraft waiting in space that humans will then go and attend to. And so a robonaut like this is an important asset to be able to make sure we maintain the things that are, are the assets that are placed in space before we get there. And so we're doing a lot of autonomous uh, systems development on how to operate it and how to do the manipulation and path planning for that. Jonathan's going to talk to you a little bit about our spin-offs. So in developing Robonaut, we made a bunch of incredible technology. And while this is a, a great application for it, we can take the little pieces of technology out of the robot and apply them to other problems we're having here on Earth. Uh, one of them has been a, a robotic assistance glove that provides uh, about 10 to 15 pounds of grasp assistance. And uh, that was important for our colleagues at General Motors because a lot, number of their assembly line workers struggle with uh, repetitive stress injuries like carpal tunnel or similar uh, ailments. And that leads to uh, leads to pain for them and then having to be trained to do other jobs. And uh, you know, we see similar issues with our crew members on board the International Space Station. Um, when you're wearing a spacesuit, it's a uh, it's a great view, but you got to work for it. So the uh, the crew members there deal with a lot of fatigue in their hands, uh, and we've applied Robonaut's forearm drive train to a spacesuit glove. And we're going through testing right now, trying to understand really how much uh, we can help them and make their lives better. Thanks, Jonathan. Are there any questions? Well, while we're waiting for folks on, online to come up with a couple questions, I've got a couple for you guys. Okay. What gives Robonaut his unique color? So this is a sort of a trademark color for our group. Um, in addition to humanoid Robonauts, uh, we work on rovers and different mobility solutions for the crew, and uh, we've also worked on exercise equipment. But we use this gold color uh, to sort of signify our work. And this, on the helmet, is, is painted. But on the metal pieces of the robot, this is anodized aluminum. And anodizing is a, a, an electrochemical process that makes a very hard coating on the outside of the metal to help protect it. And as a part of that process, you can add in a dye. And uh, we've done that for years, and it's kind of fun to show off uh, what, we've, what we've done. Okay. So, so obviously, Robonaut kind of looks like a, a couple sides. So when we were designing the helmet, we looked at a, a variety of influences from popular culture um, all the way back to like centurion armor and kind of brought together the, uh, the things that the group liked the most about all those different aspects to, to generate the, the helmet. Um, so different people see different influences based on you know what you're interested in, but for us it's, uh, it's one of the benefits of working in the research and development world is that we get to kind of have some fun with our designs and make it look cool. Okay. So, so I kind of see Robonaut, I've seen Robonaut for years, but I kind of look like a Lucha Libre wrestler to me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys see that at all? You know? A little bit, yeah. So we kind of look at him as um, an analog to a suited astronaut as okay. well. So. Okay. And the size and dimensions of Robonaut obviously are kind of similar to a human being. Was that on purpose, or was that kind of a... Yeah, the idea was to make sure that we were trying to be as close to a suited astronaut size for being able to access the same sort of places that, that astronauts do. So I think we have um, Yao Ming's wingspan, it's and the, wingspan. the bicep diameter is the same as Arnold Schwarzenegger's at his prime. Okay, awesome. <laughs> and other quick questions for you all. Obviously, Robonaut has a lot of lights and other characteristics, uh, kind of almost like a... Uh, a unique boombox. Does, does Robonaut talk or do anything? Uh, can, can, does it have a voice emitting uh, uh, characteristic? Not yeah. yet, but that's something we're working on this year. Okay. And, and I, I don't know if we have any questions on Facebook yet, but I think that uh, we're going to switch off to Facebook a little bit and ask a couple other, other questions. Yeah. Um, we have one from Alex that wants to know how strong is he? So um, our fingers are our limiting factor with that 20 pound weight demo that we have, but the arms are able, uh, are capable of doing quite a bit more. Um, because of our end effector are these fingers, we don't go much more than about a 20 pound weight. Um, LaCroix wants to know, can he do the Macarena? <laughs> so I tried that once. Yeah, I think yeah, he can do the Macarena. He can't really wiggle so much, but he's, he can do the rest of it. <laughs> 
Um, John Paul wants to know how mobile is it? Can it move around on its own outside the spacecraft? Let's look at this guy. So um, it doesn't go outside yet, but we do have a version on the inside of the International Space Station that has, we call them legs, but they don't look anything like legs, really. They're um, not anthropomorphic like the upper body. So it has gripping end effectors here that grabs the, the blue handrails that you have inside the International Space Station for the astronauts to push off from and, and, and um, position themselves. And so it is able to climb around. We do do this climbing demonstrations practice here in a gravity offload facility that um, is next door. We have a question from Guy. Does it have vision or other senses? Yeah, so inside, um, inside the helmet, we've got four cameras. Uh, two of them are used by the robot itself. We've got different machine vision algorithms to identify things that we've, we've given it like a catalog of. Uh, and then secondly, we have another set of cameras that are about the width of uh, human eyes. And you can put on a virtual reality headset and gloves and basically step into the robot. It's a really cool way to uh, take control of a high definition or high uh, degree of freedom uh, robot. Okay. Syrian wants to know, does he talk? Not yet. Not yet. We're working, working on, on that this year, uh, integrating some natural language processing in with our robot to be able to both command it with these natural language commands and also get stats back from the robot. Okay. We have another question from Michael. Does he work in real time autonomously or is he controlled back at home base? with the human computer, sensor tracking controller, etc. So we have kind of a supervised autonomy um, operating scheme that we use for it. So it is able, we just worked on last year having a, a single mouse click, basically single button push solution to doing some tasks. But a human is generally in the loop in those tasks, kind of watching over it and making sure it does the right thing and able to kind of get involved in, in guiding the robot if it seems to need help. Um, we can also, like Jonathan said, get into be telepresent in the robot and actually have the robot mimic the movements of the, the teleoperator. Um, and then we kind of have an array of different ways to control it between those two things, between telepresent and this highly supervised autonomy. Okay. We, we try to pick up the, the control mode that's best for the task at hand. You know, if, if there's a very, um, very complicated task where you need the human's training, Teleoperation totally makes sense, but if you're trying to work over time delay, that, that works less efficiently. So that's where some of the autonomy work steps in, and uh, you know we're we're really trying to let the robot do what it's good at and what people do what they're good at. Sure. Jess has a question: How is it powered? This one's got uh, just a, a plug into the wall. Uh, we have a battery for it uh, as well. It's a large lithium-ion battery uh, that we're doing testing on, trying to understand how to. Uh, how to do that, and uh, most importantly, how to use that technology safely. Mm -hmm. We have another question um, from William. How fast can he do things? It depends on um, what we're trying to do. So we have a safety system for the International Space Station that doesn't allow us to hit anything harder than a certain amount, and so we do have to limit its, uh, we actually limit its momentum, not its speed, so its arms are able to go faster than the whole body is able to um, so it tends to go fairly slow when it's around humans and in, in the, with the safety system on, but the demonstration we just saw was some of the, the faster movements it's able to do. Um, and then David has a question, what is the difference between Robonaut and Valkyrie? Uh, Valkyrie is um, kind of the next generation, it was a, a follow-on to Robonaut, and it was meant for um, tasks on the Earth, so it has legs, human-like legs, and, and it walks. Um, and is able to uh, do tasks like disaster relief. And so it was built for the uh, DARPA Robotics Challenge, but also kind of the, the thought of sending something like that to Mars to help set up habitats and those sorts of things on planetary surfaces as well. Robonaut is more of a, a zero-G kind of robot. It's meant to climb or to do things that um, it may have a wheeled base and those sorts of things, for example. Um, but it is... Um, uh, more meant to be that, um, that human safe crew assistance sort of robot. Chris has a question. Which famous voice would you want to give it if you could? Hard one. <laughs> Sean Connery. Oh, that's a good one. 
That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see if we. How many Robonauts are currently planned for ISS missions? If only one, are more planned? So we have one up there right now. We have eight, eight of them, them in total. Seven on the ground. And one is one of those seven is in Warren, Michigan, at uh, General Motors, since they were our partner with this. Um, the there's no plan for any other ISS robots. We're really looking more towards the future exploration missions when we're doing caretaking. And the robot that's up on the ISS right now is for technology development advancement um, of the technologies we develop on the ground for that, for that reason. Um, are there any implications for Mars? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you look at some of the planning that's going on for Mars missions, you know, we're we're not going to have people there all the time. Uh, some of the scenarios have the, the components and uh, logistics like food and, and clothes and uh, repair parts arriving before the crew. So we're looking at having a robot there to support those efforts. That way the crew just has to land, they walk in the door, and they get to work. And we have some comments coming in that people want to see another demo. Could you guys do another demo for us for those just joining? Sure. Absolutely. So we'll show you um, a little bit more about our dexterity. And we call this one hand motions. And so I mentioned a little bit that we wanted to have Robonaut be able to handle the same sorts of tools and interfaces that the suited crew members were able to handle. And so we developed our, our hands and our fingers based on a taxonomy that um, was developed based on machinist crafts. We were able to hit about 95% of those crafts. Um, Showing here how the, the fingers are able to get very close or touch in, in many circumstances, and the dexterity of our hands is something that we're, we're very proud of. How long was the Robonaut program in development? The Robonaut program started in the late 1990s with Robonaut 1. Um, we have pictures on the wall if you wanted to, to shoot up, there's one up there. Um, but it is uh, there was a partnership with DARPA, and the idea was still the same to have an astronaut assistant for a suited astronauts. We did a lot of autonomy development for robotics with that one. We put it on um, several wheels and mobile bases and took it out to the field, had to pick up rocks as kind of a, an astronaut as an assistant for um, geology types of missions, you know, on Mars and going to collecting samples. Um, and then this one started in 2007, 2008 time frame and with a partnership with General Matters. Um, so it's been, it's been about a t almost a 20 year project so far. Sergio has a question. Why did you choose to design it to look like a human? It's, it provides you some benefits. Uh, first off, um, NASA, for example, has invested tons of effort and money in developing tools for our suited astronauts. And by designing a robot that can interface with all of those tools, we're, we're saving a lot of work um, rather than going off and like making a robot its own set of tools. Uh, so that's been the primary motivator to have it look like a person. But that, there's also some familiarity about having a humanoid robot. If, if I'm working side by side with this robot on a task outside station, it looks sort of like me, and I know how it's going to move, how it's going to interact. And that provides a level of uh, well, comfort for the uh, people working around it. And uh, just, it's uh, like... It's a lot more fun to play with, too. So yeah, the crew true. members have tended to take Robonaut in as one of their own. And I, we think that being in this humanoid form definitely helps. It helps being that. accepted. That's the word I'm looking for. No, our 2D type was accepted. You know, even yeah. it was like a trash puppy. Kind of yeah. thing, so. <laughs> Arturo has a question, range of temperatures that it can function properly in. We haven't done a whole lot of testing on the system as a whole, um, but we took it out to the Arizona desert a few years ago, and I was really hot, but the robot was fine. <laughs> yeah, it also got cold at night, too, being in the yeah. desert, and so, I mean, a, a, a fairly decent range. Gabrielle wants to know, what's Robonaut's purpose on the space station? Robonaut's purpose on the space station is to be a test bed for um, technology development for our future exploration missions. So and one of the proving ground missions that we're looking closely at right now that's scheduled for the mid-2020s um, is sending a habitat into cislunar or around the moon orbit 
Um, the plan for that is to basically have crew members there for about two weeks per year. Um, so about 50 weeks a year, it's going to be unmanned. And during that time, we'd like to have a caretaker to be able to fix anything that breaks and just have a set of hands on board that habitat in case anything goes wrong. So uh, we're developing technologies basically to do that. Right now, we're working on logistics management. So taking cargo bags from a logistics module, like a resupply mission, and putting them away into the right places on the International Space Station. Alex wants to know, how is it given commands? Can it, spoken to? Can it be spoken to? Can it speak? So we're, we're working on interacting with the robot through natural language, just like you know, we're talking to you guys today. Uh, right now, we use uh, a computer console, and you can see some of it. And we've got an updated version uh, of this. Uh, this, like we said earlier, is the first robot we built. So it's, uh, it's got some, some heritage tools. Uh, but we, we have a series of commands that are linked together and uh, we can view output from the robot. It's telling us what sensors are, um, are, are determining. and uh, It's really pretty easy to operate. Okay. Um, let's see if we have some more questions. Well, while we're waiting for a few, few more questions, let's tell us a little bit more about your own background. So, Julia, uh, you, you got a PhD. So. Obviously, that's a lot of school. So tell us uh, what, what your background is. Um, I have a, I'm a mechanical engineer by education. I had my bachelor's at Purdue University and my master's and um, PhD in mechanical engineering at California Tech Institute of Technology, Caltech, up in Pasadena. Um, and then I've done software ever since. And my technical background is I, I wrote the, a lot of the control and safety system for the, for the Revenant and did some of the supervisory control um, methods for it. Well, before it became a project manager. Okay, wow, pretty impressive. And Jonathan, what about yourself? Yeah, I, um, so I grew up here near the Johnson Space Center, and uh, I was actually part of our first robotics team, so I was introduced to, to robotics. So that's in high school? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a high school yeah, uh, job, and we, we kind of think of that as our farm club around here, since we're kind of in the, the baseball spirit with the World Series wrapping up yesterday. Um, but I, I went to Texas A&M, and I have a degree in aerospace engineering. Um, so I started co-oping, which is a, a program, I think it's now called Pathways Interns, uh, where university students can come work for a semester uh, at NASA. And you kind of go back and forth between work and school, and it's a, it's a cool way to like apply what you're learning in the classroom to NASA problems. So I started working here on Robinaut um, full-time in about 2007, doing hands and forearms. I've also gotten to drive the, uh, the robot on space station, which is pretty cool. Awesome. So, so if, that's a quick throwback. If, if anybody wants to be an intern at NASA, we, we've got we're always looking for new, bright, shiny pennies. It doesn't matter if you're an engineer, if you're a public, uh, you're a communications major, if you're a writer, if you're a business major. Feel free to go on intern.nasa.gov or just Google NASA interns, and you can certainly find out more information about that. Now, Julia, what about yourself? Were you an intern here? Or I was. I was a co-op as well. I started co-oping long ago in 2002, and then. Was uh, full time. I went all the way through my graduate studies as a co-op. It was full time starting in 2009. Awesome. Lots of school. Okay. Cool. <laughs> and now I'm going to ask you a, kind of a, a little bit of a silly question, but I think it, it's more, pretty relevant. Who's your favorite movie robot? I already decided that it was R2D2 earlier today. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan, what about yourself? I, you know, kind of plug R2. It did a, uh, a reboot of the Space Camp movie a couple of years ago, and we got to go out to the set, um, and I was driving the robot behind the scenes, which was pretty cool. So. Okay, cool. It was Space Warriors, right? Something like that. Okay, awesome. So, because I'm in the movie uh, frame of mind here, if you pull off Robonaut's headpiece, uh, does he have a red glowing eye like the T-1000, or? And there might be a red glowing LED somewhere in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's, no. there's a couple of, <laughs> couple of boards that when they turn on do the Cylon sweep, but we're not going to talk about that. Okay, okay, okay. Good deal, good deal. And I think we might have some more questions from the internet now. So back to the internet. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, how would you fix anything if it happened, if something happened to it in space? 
So we, we train the astronauts on uh, the basic repairs that we, we expect. So for example, um, all of the, the fingers are tendon driven. We've got a, a series of actuators inside the forearm, and we teach the crew members how to go change one of those tendons. Uh, they, they think it's pretty fun, but thankfully we, we haven't had to do that in space yet. From the peanut gallery, is Robinata lefty or righty? He's ambidextrous. Okay. So it doesn't matter which, which hand we ask him to use, he works out fine the other way, which is really nice if we do have, you know, like a broken tendon on a, on a hand or something and we need to do a task, we can just do it in the other, on the other side. So the, the weightlifting task that you did earlier um, can be run with either hand? Okay. I think if I had done it with my left hand, I would have been a little bit... Uh, 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 no, that, that's all right. We'll, we'll do that next time. All right. Well, I think that's it. But thank you so much for joining us, and thanks for all your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Facebook.